Welcome everyone to this webinar on behalf of Zend. Um, this webinar is Zend Framework 2 for Zend Framework 1 developers. So who am I? My name is Gary Hawkin. I'm the uh, technical manager at a streaming media company called Yango TV. Um, I'm a Zend Framework 1 contributor for a number of years and also um, contributed slightly to Zen Framework 2, but was involved in the meetings and the, uh, the development flow of ZF2. Um, I've been a web developer using PHP and other server-side scripting technologies for over 15 years. Yep, that's me there, dressed up as Elvis. So if you want to get in touch, at GH Twitter, um, the blog there that this um, this uh, webinar is, this presentation is based on posts from that blog, and I'm always available uh, in ZF Talk on Freenode. So what is this? This is a um, an introduction to Zen Framework 2 by very, very loosely equating the components to their Zen Framework 1 equivalents, if they have Zen Framework 1 equivalents. Um, some of the key components in ZF2 will have no equivalents, so we'll just have to introduce them. Um, this talk is aimed at people who are familiar Zen Framework 1 developers, so really it's, it's aimed at the people who um, it's aimed at the people who've done some ZF1 development work, not necessarily experts, but you know you will uh, gain more if you're familiar with the, the design and development concepts of ZF1. So why? Why do we need this? Well, there's so much difference between Zen Framework 1 and Zen Framework 2. Really, they, they share only a name. Um, the two frameworks are not, Z, ZF2 is not backwards compatible to ZF1 in any way, shape, or form. Um, Zen Framework 2 can be the same way Zen Framework 1 is. It can be slightly intimidating to get started with. You know, where do I start? What do I do? Um, and Zen Framework 2 is an amazing product. So, you know, this is aimed to stop people being intimidated um, with Zen Framework 2 and to say, look, the concepts are similar. If you know Zen Framework 1, there's no need, you know, to not jump straight into ZF2. There will be code. Yes, there will be code. Um, these slides will all be available uh, on SlideShare uh, after the presentation. So the code will be available if you want to have a look at it after the presentation. So, getting started. There's no Zend tool in ZF1. So the easiest way to um, the easiest way to to start off in Zend Framework 1 is to use Zend tool to create yourself a bare bones uh, project. You know, you can then create controllers, you can create models, you can create DB tables using Zen tool. There is no Zend tool presently in Zen Framework 2. Um, instead, we are using a skeleton application, which is available on GitHub, um, which you can download and have a complete work in MVC application that is, in all honesty, the starting point for most people working with ZF2 projects. Um, the, the framework also embraces Composer, those of you who've used other frameworks or have used other modular PHP projects will be aware of Composer. It's a way of handling your PHP dependencies and your auto-loading. Um, this is all covered very extensively in the uh, the in Rob Allen's album Quick Start. So we won't go over exactly how to get a project set up. Just to say the main differences between one and two, there's no Zen tool. So the second main difference in my mind between one and two is that Zen Framework One had enormously long underscore separated class names so that we didn't have collisions between the various components and your own uh, objects and classes. So in Zen Framework Two, because we're PHP 5.3 minimum, then we have namespaces which allow your code to be much more readable. Um, 
Personally, if there was one thing I wish I'd started using before I started using ZF2, it would have been namespaces. Um, they're awesome, pretty much. Anyone working with PHP now should really be using namespaces. So a typical Zen Framework 1 uh, controller, extending Zen underscore controller underscore action, and we're simply uh, have an index action there, and we're setting up a log log file, a logger, and writing something. Setting up a logger and adding a writer to that logger. Zen Framework 2, that slide is very badly formed. Please excuse me. I hope they all won't be like that after importing into WebEx. Um, so namespace is application slash controller, and then we normally have two lines there um, for PSR2 standards. And we're using Zend slash MVC slash controller slash abstract action controller. We're using Zend slash log slash logger, and we're using Zend slash log slash writer slash stream as writer. Now we've told this PHP class exactly which uh, classes it should be using when we refer to those keywords. So we can now say class featured controller extends abstract action controller, not Zend underscore. Uh, MVC underscore controller underscore abstract action controller. And we can also say logger is new logger, writer is new writer, logger add writer. Much more succinct, much easier to understand, and also with the added benefit that if my slides weren't as messed up as they are, you have a nice use block at the top of every uh, PHP uh, file and class, and that tells you exactly what the dependencies are of this class to other classes. So. Goodbye to long underscore 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 separated underscore class, and hello to nice snappy namespace class. So the question is, um, will namespaces work if you don't use the auto loading? Yeah, definitely. The the namespaces are a way of addressing PHP classes. The the beauty of them, um, and with the the PSR not one and two specifications are that. Zen Framework 2 adheres to the PSR standards, um, which means that each um, each of the uh, individual um, parts of this namespace, or so nice, snappy, namespaced and class, should map directly to a um, to a directory, a folder, so that auto loading is pretty much taken care of if you're using namespaced. So swap those uh, backslashes for forward slashes, and you can find class.php in slash nice, slash snappy, slash namespaced. So it's definitely part of the whole um, framework's auto-loading strategy going forward, but you don't need to use namespaces just to uh, to simplify auto-loading. So modules. Um, there is a concept of Zen Framework 1. Um, OK, just sorry, just before we go on to modules, I don't mind answering this one either. Will there be separate namespaces for Zend and Zendx components? Um, the answer to that is no, there won't, because when I've finished speaking about modules, you'll understand that there are no um, Zendx components anymore. Um, there are modules, and we'll, the question will be answered after I've spoken through this um, section on modules. So. Zen Framework 1, is it modular, really? It has a concept of modules, but I think they are, they're not um, particularly modular. Uh, modules in Zen Framework 1 still rely on um, an application level bootstrap, an application level uh, application inny. Um, they don't really act as standalone um, chunks of code, discrete sections of code that you can drop into any project. Um, Within Zen Framework 2, it was very much a primary concern that the the framework should be completely and entirely modular. So in, in Zen Framework 2, modules are very much first-class citizens. There is no concept of an application in ZF2. Everything is a module. You can have an application module to pull all the other modules together if you want to, but you don't actually have to. So. Um, Instead of the, the Zendx namespace, as, you, as we uh, discussed a moment ago, there's a number of modules which are created by the ZFC Commons team, which is the Zen Framework Commons contributor team. Um, they try and pull together modules that do common 
um, and discrete tasks. And things like ZFC user are a great introduction to modules. You'll find ZFC user in the ZFC Commons GitHub repository. Um, and it's a fantastic way to, to browse through the code and understand how and why ZFC user um, sits inside um, a Zen Framework 2 application, bootstrapping. So bootstrapping in Zen Framework 1 is very much done um, on an application level and on a per module basis. So every module in Zen Framework 1 has to have a bootstrap.php and also the application has to have a bootstrap.php. Um, there is no actual application level bootstrapping in Zen Framework 2. So there is no concept of an application, there's only a concept of modules. So each module bootstraps its own resources, um, it does that in a number of ways, via module.php, which you can loosely equate to the old bootstrap.php in, in Zen Framework 1. Um, but it will also bootstrap its own resources via the service manager and the event manager. Um, if you're looking at um, the place to bootstrap uh, classes and uh, methods in your, sorry, if you're looking for places to bootstrap things in your Zen Framework 2 um, module, then the on bootstrap method of module.php is, is always a good starting point. So the question is, what's an example of a module other than an app? The perfect example um, of, of a module other than an app would be the ZFC user module that I spoke about earlier. Because the ZFC user module actually handles all of your user login, registration, and authentication for your entire app. But it's contained in a self-contained module that you can just drop in. So as we will speak to on the next slide, which I believe is routing, um, it, uh, it uh, applies its own routes to the application. So your application, if you drop in ZFC user, you can access the user login and registration pages from the slash user route. It actually uh, hand, it generates um, events so that you can tap into user login in and extend in the user login process if you have any um, application specific uh, logic that you need to, to do. And it, it also um, uh, provides all of the, the service level layers and the database level layers. So it's, such, it's a complete self-contained module of code that allows you to add user registration and login to your site. It's an authentication module. But it's completely and utterly self-contained. So, for example, you might, have a you might have a module in your own application that handles login. That's another good example. You have a login, logging, not login, uh, as in logging to a file. Um, you have a logging module that will set up the logger. It will um, start, uh, start set, set up the logger, start the logger, and also will catch events from within the rest of your application and will log those. So the logging module can be turned on or off and dropped into this project, that project, or any other project you want. I hope that answers the question. So, okay, the service manager's next. The service manager is a new component for Zen Framework 2. Um, if I was going to be incredibly um, simplistic, and if it helps you to understand what the service manager does, you could very loosely, and I mean very, very loosely, equate it to Zend Registry from ZF1. Um, of course, Zend Registry is literally only an object store. It's just a way to um, put uh, to put things into the framework for later retrieval. Z the service manager in Zend Framework 2 is so much more. It handles the lazy loading of classes, and it handles the dependency injection of those classes. So you can call something through the service manager, and if you haven't instantiated something that that service depends on yet, the service manager will handle that for you. So um, it can be declared in the module.config.php or in module.php. The module.php is the similar file to the bootstrap from ZF1. The module.config.php is the array of uh, configuration information for your module. Um, 
it doesn't really matter where you declare it because they, all of these configs get merged into one giant merged config. Um, I would suggest using module just .php um, just because it helps you to get better caching results, but you can do it in any place really. Um, and there are more than one service manager in ZF2. Um, just to add added confusion, we'll, we'll see the different service managers later on. So, okay, the question was, can a module call functions from other modules? And Ralph has answered that quite succinctly in the Q&A pane. The answer is yes. Basically, a module can call functions from any module that's been uh, loaded into the application. So the service manager, I would say, is one of the key concepts of Zen Framework 2. Um, it's not as difficult to understand code-wise as it is to actually explain. So uh, my code has nicely been misformatted again. I think we'll have to um, suggest that all of the code through this presentation will be, uh, will be uh, presented like this, sadly. So namespaces application, we're using Zend MVC controller, abstract controller, and we're using service app, uh, using application service my service. So this is a standard uh, controller. It extends abstract action controller, um, and it has a dependency of my service. So in a typical in typical PHP fashion, we use the constructor to uh, to receive a copy of my service and set it to the protected. Uh, property my service. Nothing really rocket science there. So this is the service manager configuration to allow that dependency injection to happen without us having to actually um, worry about it, so to speak. Because the controller, anything that extends abstract action controller, um, the routing automatically looks in the controller config array for factories to instantiate controllers. That means that if you look at the bottom section there rather than the top section first, we can see that if the routing of ZF2 decides that we need an instance of my controller, then it will look in the factories array for an entry of my controller, and then it will instantiate it using that factory. It doesn't have to have um, an entry in the factories array because some of the controllers will not have any dependencies. They'll just be invocable as they are. But if your controller has dependencies on services, so you need a service to populate some view variables, then you can inject it straight into the controller using the getController.config uh, function. So as you can see here, we, gr we are actually using the service locator, which is passed um, it's passed into the the, the closure uh, to grab the service manager. Note that the service locator and the service manager are not the same thing. The service locator is a global service manager, and we want to pull the application service manager from within there. So service locator, get service manager, get my service. And you can see quite clearly that in the top array, my service is defined as a service uh, config. So my service also has its own factory in the factories array, and it basically just instantiates um, it, it instantiates an instance of application service my service, sets some property to true, and then returns my service. So when we instantiate my controller, um, we pass it the instance of my service, and we return my controller. There's a code error right there. So my service in the bottom function should be my controller. So I've seen the questions. I'll um, get to the end of this section, and then I'll come back and answer them. And that is the end of this section. So the question is, um, OK, the, the, the question regarding the performance of the service manager and the, um, the dynamic autoload generator is, is um, out of the scope of this, um, this tutorial. Um, I would suggest Ralph may answer that for you in chat. Um, and the second question, what's the difference between the service locator and the DI, is being answered right here. So the dependency injector is an automatic service locator. You, if, you, if we go back a slide, you can imagine that with a project with many services, 
and many um, classic, uh, many controllers, your uh, module configuration is going to quickly get filled up with a huge factories array, where you're um, te where you're telling your application, you're telling your module with what um, uh, controller depends on which service, which service depends on another service. The dependency injector will use introspection to actually determine that automatically. However, the automaticness comes at a, at a cost. And the cost at this moment is that it's fantastic in development because you can just code without having to worry about dependencies. The DI will take care of all that for you. In production, do you really want your PHP introspecting all of the classes that it uses to find its dependencies and then fulfilling those dependencies? You know, is that something that realistically um, you would feel is acceptable in production? Um, personally, <laughs> I'd rather uh, define my dependencies in a, a lightning fast array, but, um, you know, I know some people do still use the dependency injector, and I know that there's um, a number of modules available now that will take a uh, dependency injector and generate a cache file, which is very similar to a service manager um, factories array, so you can have the best of both worlds. You can you can develop using the dependency injector so that um, your, your um, development is very rapid, you're not having to go into these arrays and closures and, and define factories. But when you're ready to deploy, as part of your deployment strategy, you can generate these dependency injector cache files that means that the introspection doesn't happen. Um, there's a few modules out there. I'll probably um, blog on that in the next week or two. Um, but definitely pop into ZF Talk on Freenode if you want to learn more information about that. There's a few guys on there who've written modules who will help you out straight away. So the question is, why do the closures receive a service locator, whereas the others receive a service manager? What is the difference? So the confusion, realistically, there is confusion in ZF2 between what's termed a service locator and what's termed a service manager. So if I go back to the slide, um, effectively, uh, the controller, the get controller config there, receives a different service manager than the get service config. We use a different discrete service manager to um, define controller services than we do to define application services. That means that when the router needs to instantiate a controller, it only has to look in one place. It's not looking through a, a huge um, you know, uh, array of 20 to, to 50 to 150 services. It's looking in the controller service manager where it knows it will find only what it needs. Um, of course, the service locator that's passed to the, um, the controller factory has a, uh, a get method to grab the, um, the service manager, which is actually an implementation of the service locator, just for more confusion. But basically, there's a number of really good blogs on the service manager, the different service managers that are available in ZF2. Um, and essentially, people will refer to service locator and service manager, um, and they will effectively be meaning the same thing. So the only thing you really need to be aware of is if we just use the term service locator briefly. There are a number of service locators in um, Zen Framework. Um, and you need to be sure you're looking to grab the right service from the right locator. Um, there's, we'll discuss another one when we talk about ZenView in a moment. Um, but it's just something to be aware of, really. You'll quickly understand where, which service locator you need and where, and where you get it from. So Event Manager is another new concept for Zen Framework 2. Um, I do believe uh, it was backported to uh, Zen Framework 1.12. I'm sure somebody will be able to confirm that. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think it was backported to Zen Framework 1.12. And it's used to trigger calls on discrete events, both in, in the framework itself, particularly used in the framework MVC implementation, but also in your own modules. You know, it's, it's not an MVC-only 
um, idea. You can definitely be using this, and you should be using this in your own modules. So as a really basic example, um, here's a module.php for a, a, a fictional module. Um, and basically, all we're doing here is we are attaching a, an event to the load modules.pre uh, trigger. So before the modules are loaded, um, we're going to do something clever. We're going to um, set up, make some decisions on what, what the modules should be loaded, depending on environment. You know, we're going to um, do anything we want before any of the other modules are loaded. Um, of course, this module needs to be loaded for that to happen. But uh, it's a it's a good indication of how the the MVC will trigger events as it's bootstrapping your application. Another idea is that you have a um, you have a, a user module that handles your user's login in and login out. And when you, your user is logged out, you want to clear up some temporary files you've created. So you, in your module.php, you use the module manager to get the event manager and attach a myuser.logout function um, trigger. Now, this is a custom trigger that has been defined just for this logout application in your user module. This isn't something that's generated by the MVC. So when that, um, when that trigger happens, you want to do the cleaning up of some temp cache files here. In your service class, when you're doing your logout, when you're actually handling your logout, um, if you've got the, the event manager passed into that service, which we'll presume you can do using the service manager, as we've discussed, um, you can use the event manager to trigger that myuser.logout. So effectively, what this means is that throughout your application, you can trigger events from anywhere within your application. As I've, I've stated before, it's incredibly useful for uh, logging. If you have you know, a logging event, um, you can effectively log using that event anywhere in your application. Um, it's a an incredibly powerful uh, method of of working. It's a very good object-oriented method of working, and it's something that, if you're interested in, I would heartily advise you to um, take a look at the code of ZFC user, because that's using events in all the right ways and in all the right places. The quest okay, so the question is, can we pass a parameter to the event? And the answer is, of course you can. Yes, you can. Um, you can pass a parameter as the um, the second um, uh, the second parameter of the trigger in the bottom in the logout function there. So you can pass an array of parameters as the second uh, the second uh, parameter of trigger, and you can grab that then in the actual um, where you're defining the event handler. So routing. This is another um, can of worms that people struggle to understand. In Zen Framework 1, we only have application level routing. Um, and in Zen Framework 2, there is no application level routing. So it couldn't be more different. A typical way of defining a route in Zen Framework 1, ah, oh, look at this, terrible, again, code. I can't edit it, can I? No. So unfortunately, the code isn't great. If you've, um, if you've got a uh, slide share available, then you should be able to grab these uh, these slides to see the code better. I can only apologize. So um, defining a route in Zen Framework 1 is it's, it's straightforward enough. It's simple enough. Resources.router.routes.product, which is the root name, dot .root equals slash product slash the product ID parameter. Um, and then we want to pass that to the controller product and the action details. So very simple to um, very simple to set up. You typically add configured Zen controller router root objects to the standard Zen controller router rewrite object to bootstrap. These application any shortcuts exist, but it's cumbersome. It's slow. Routes are flat listed, and the router will visit each entry until it finds a match. It's also restricted only to HTTP requests which isn't the best. So in Zen Framework 2, as with 
most things, we have a an array that defines our routes. So the, this array will get merged into the global merged config, as we call it, that um, mean that where, where all of the configuration data is held. So we're declaring here a segment type route, which has a root of slash product slash parameter product ID. A good thing to note there is that there's const we can we can define constraints. So product ID can only be a, a uh, an integer, a number, and um, we can set some defaults. So it goes to the namespace application controller. The controller is product, and the actual is de details. It's easy to read that and understand how it's comparable to an application any um, entry in Zen Framework One. Um, the question, the questions we've had for this is, uh, how do we get the router to recognize both, for example, user slash login, slash user slash login, and slash user slash login slash? Um, you can you can define optional uh, parts to the root, so anything in square brackets will will be defined as optional. Um, the other question is, where does this array live? The array lives in the same place as we just discussed with regards to the service manager configurations. So it lives in module.php or in um, uh, module.config.php. Um, anything that can be declared in um, module.config.php has a shortcut function where you can append to that array in, in module.php. Sounds complicated, but it's actually complete second nature when you get used to it. Module level routing. So each module contributes its own route. And a good example of that, coming back to ZFC user, it adds the slash user route to your application without you needing to do anything. It's much quicker and much more flexible than the, the flat file um, routing in ZF1. It's tree-like. So once the routing process is past a branching point, it won't look in the other branches of that uh, of that of that uh, area of the array, so it's much much quicker than routing in Zen from Oak One. I guess the trade-off is the learning curve and the debugging. I've got a personal gripe that when you get a routing area error with multiple modules, it's difficult sometimes to track down which module is contributing the route you're having problems with. Um, I think that's maybe a personal gripe rather than a uh, rather than something that everyone has problems with but it, there's definitely a uh, there's definitely a more uh, there's more of a learning curve rather than just adding a, a flat uh, entry into an application.ini so we've got a number of questions here and I will try and answer these now what happens to the requests with parameters which do not fit into the regex constraints so we're talking about the constraint section there um, this route won't get matched if the if the request doesn't fit into the parameter uh, constraints, then the route won't get matched. So you'll get a 404, or it'll match a catch-all route, or something along those lines. Um, probably 404. What happens to the request? Well, we just answered that. What's the besides category element? I'm sorry, uh, the person who answered that question, I absolutely don't understand what you mean. What's the... So the category element there is the name, the, the, the category element there, the category key is the name of the root. I should have named that product so that it was comparable with the root, the messed up root I showed you here, where the, the product, the name of the root is product. I should have changed category to product. Um, that's literally just the name of that root. Uh, what's the purpose of the namespace application controller? Is this, is it just the same as controller equals application controller product? Absolutely. Um, it's just it just you use the namespace to tell the um, the the router where to find that controller. Basically, um, you don't you don't actually need the underscore underscore namespace in there. Um, it just depends it just depends to it. So it'll it, you can you can alias um, controllers there. It'll basically what will happen there is it'll look in the um, the controller service locator to try and find application slash controller slash product or um, product controller if you've aliased it. Type equals segment. What does type equals segment mean is the question. Um, <laughs> thank you for your, the next question. Uh, type equals segment means that um, 
there's a number of different routing types you can use. You can use segment, you can use reg, regex, you can use um, uh, static. So this is a segmented route because it's slash product slash parameter. Okay, we'll come back to these questions if we've got any time because we are running shy at the moment. So Zen view, um, again, is a massive refactor between um, Zen Framework 1 and Zen Framework 2. Um, in Zen Framework 1, you assign variables directly to the view. Um, the renderer and the data container are the same object. A Zen, Zen 1 view, Zen underscore view, is, is both a data container and a renderer. Um, and you have one um, and you have one view for the layout and for the view in Zen framework two you assign variables to view models and return those to the view um, the view renderer and the data container are separate objects so the data container is called a view model and that's just used for storing your data that you pass into the view the view renderer is responsible for outputting the data that is in the view model um, by default, it calls, a, it calls a view script in exactly the same way as it would in Zen Framework 1. So a view script where you can handle your, your um, view variables and output them into HTML. Um, but there are other um, view renderers. There's things like the JSON strategy that will convert the entire view model into JSON. Um, there's the feed strategy. There's, there's a number of different um, view renderers that you can use to output the data from the view model. You can return an array from your action to automatically convert to a view model. Just a quick point. So view helpers, um, Zen Framework 1, easy to write and invoke, and use the helper broker to find your, your view helper, which was a massive performance hog because it uses a, a, a PHP native function called call underscore user underscore func, which anyone who... Um, which anyone who has uh, looked to increase performance in Zen from Book 1 will know is one of the first points to look at. Zen from Book 2, it's still easy to write and invoke, but it's not a performance hog because it uses a service locator to find the views, the view helpers. So here's a, here's a typical view helper in Zen from Book 1. We add a, uh, a link to it in the application any. And then we define um, a simple function that extends end view helper abstract that just returns a string. There's no easy way to alias helpers in Zen Framework 1. And the prefix of my underscore view underscore helper is stripped. So you can have clashes between view helpers in 1 and 2. Um, the helper broker is really slow. It basically looks at the stack of prefixes and they pass and then loop through it to see if it can autoload. So it's not performant. In Zen 2, um, the, uh, the, view, the view helper broker, basically the view helper plugin manager, sorry, is a subclass of the service manager. So it, it can locate helpers um, using normal uh, service manager methods. So here you can see this is a um, uh, get view helper config function, which is adding to the merged config in module to PHP in exactly the same way as we were with the service manager previously. So we're saying we have an invocable. So when, we, when we're looking for this view bacon, use my view helper bacon, and as long as it extends an abstract helper, we use the invoke method of PHP 5.3 to return the string. Uh, the invoke method is much faster than the call user function. So ZenDB, uh, again, a uh, huge refactor between 1 and 2. Um, ZenDB adapter and ZenDB table gateway. Um, ZenDB adapter. We use the, the service manager to pass the database adapter around. Um, ZenDB, Zend underscore DB underscore table has been uh, completely rewritten uh, as Zend underscore DB underscore table gateway. It's similar but different. I do apologize. We are going to have to um, go through the rest of these slides, and then we'll come back and answer any questions I can, given the time constraint. So in Zen from Book 1, setting up your database is uh, pretty straightforward. You literally set up the adapter and application in E. Um, 
so you just set up a username, your password, and your your server and your database, and then you, as long as you extend Zend underscore db underscore table underscore abstract, the the uh, that class will automatically uh, use the default adapter. So it'll use your default adapter to to connect to the database. In Zend Framework two. We use the we use the merged config to um, set up a factory for our um, DB adapter. There's a point of note here, so effectively all we're doing is saying that look for the adapter um, key in the in the service manager factories. The point of note here is that we're using config slash autoload slash database dot local dot php. Anything that's .local.php or .global.php in the autoload directory of your application will automatically be loaded. So it's nice to put the DB adapter settings into the into there um, as database.local.php, and then you can easily exclude them from your version control. So here's our um, service manager uh, entry for a Zend slash db slash table gateway. The question, so the question is local versus global, and the answer is absolutely nothing apart from anything that is um, anything that is dot local dot php or dot global dot php gets auto loaded from that directory. Um, it's just it's personal choice. There is absolutely no difference between the the way that they are uh, merged into the the end config. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, we've got a module, and we add to the service the service manager config a user table factory that um, basically gets the adapter from the previous slide and returns a new table gateway with the user table and passing that adapter. Pretty straightforward once you understand how the service manager is used. The um, controller is then basically grab in the user table straight out of the service locator. Um, please don't do it like this. This is just a case of um, creating the slide so that it's nice and quick. You should always be using a um, an extra service layer and you should always um, you should always be injecting using the constructor, not using the service locator directly like that. Um, this is just an example of how to get the service manager to inject the adapter into your table gateways. Um, but it's pretty much um, as simple to use NDB table gateway as it is to use end underscore db underscore table. So there's also, using ZenDB table gateway, there's also object hydration built into the, um, into the framework. So the hydrator will return you uh, an object, a hydrated class, which is great, but we haven't got time to go into here. Uh, there's a link to Evan Curie's blog post, which explains that nicely. Zen form. Um, it's, it's, again, it's completely rewritten. So those of you who's wrestled with Zen form decorators will be glad to know that decorators no longer exist. Um, there's a number of view helpers that allow you to easily output the various form elements. So you don't, you don't render an entire form in ZF2 like you do in ZF1. You use the view helpers to render the parts of the form in the way that you want to render them, but of course you've still got the um, you've still got the the flexibility and the power of the forms being automatically processed and validated and filtered. Um, the filters and the validators have been re re rewritten to chains, which makes it a lot more easy to understand. Uh, but basically, there's a uh, webinar that Rob Allen gave a few weeks ago that will give you a great introduction to Zenform for ZF2. Um, so I guess we'll go back now. Uh, we had a little bit more time than I expected. So we'll, we'll take any questions you might have at this point. Uh, we've got about, what, five minutes for questions. Um, these slides and feedback, always appreciated that joined in. And feel free to tweet me, drop me a, a message in uh, ZF Talk with any uh, further questions you have outside of this webinar. So are there any more questions? So 
let's answer the easiest one first. The question is the URL of the webinar slides. They're available on the link that you see there. The joined in link has the slides uh, available. So the next question is, is there an option to use YAML files for module settings, or was it ever considered? Uh, Ralph will probably be a better guy to answer that, but I believe that there is no current um, method to use YAML files or, or any files or um, non-array files of any method, XML, JSON. Um, is that correct, uh, Ralph? Uh, I don't know that we have a YAML processor, um, but effectively anything that you wanted to, to accomplish with a configuration format, you, you would just have to implement the, the config interface. So they could be YAML. At the end of the day, all of our configura configuration files are converted to PHP and then merged together. So yeah. it doesn't necessarily matter where the information comes from or what format it comes in, uh, just so that the keys and the hierarchy matches up when it's uh, finally time to merge everything together. And of course, the the, power, the beauty of this is if you want to have your configuration all in XML or JSON or YAML, you can just write a module that will take your configuration files and return an array in the right format for the framework to be able to merge it into the global config. So the next question is, uh, why should you use the Zend Adapter Table Gateway instead of just PDO and Clean SQL? The same reason that people have been using Zend underscore DB underscore Table or Doctrine or any of your other favorite um, database uh, ORMs and things. It's just to, to make life easier for yourself. Um, just just to allow you to uh, to move database uh, providers with ease to programmatically um, query a database rather than having to um, generate the strings yourself. The same old, same old answers that we basically get every time people ask why you should abstract your database access. So this is a great question. Um, the question is, there seems to be more code in Zen Framework 2 to execute the same thing as in Zen Framework 1. Considering the learning curve and all, why should I be using Zen Framework 2? Which is a fantastic question. Um, there's what, we're, what I showed in these slides today, you have to remember, is the neat raw code to accomplish tasks. I could show the same code in Zen Framework 1 without the convenience layer. So if we didn't have a an e file that can be parsed and set up your bootstrapping in Zen Framework 1, imagine how the code would look if I was comparing like for like. So for example, where we're setting up the database using the any file in Zen Framework 1 here, that's that's um, an, a, a convenience layer, the any file, that was added um, late late on in Zen Framework 1's lifespan. So before that convenience layer was added, you would have had to have done something similar in bootstrap.php to create your adapter and to put it into to Zen registry. So effectively, you would have had to have done something similar to this in Zen Framework 1 before that convenience layer was added. Um, why should you use Zen Framework 2? Um, well, because it's a far superior product in many ways to Zen Framework 1. It helps you to, pro to, to code in a more structured and in a more um, scalable, maintainable method by using great object-oriented practices like service managers, dependency injection, events, um, in my personal opinion. In ZenDB, why are their driver and platform separate? Uh, Ralph, would you take that one? I guess that's your... Um, expertise? Yeah, actually, I, I didn't know it was on me. Let me back up just a little bit, just to extend on the, the ZF2 question. Um, if you want to think about it like this, one of the, the key benefits of Zen Framework 2 is modularity and the, the ability for people to write modules that other people can consume easily. Those things wouldn't be possible if there weren't components like Service Manager, Event Manager at the infrastructure level. So, you know, all that code that you, you think is, you know, a little bit more taxing, it's providing a rich ecosystem at the end of the day, so you can just go drop in the FC user and be immediately working with a login form without having to code anything. Um, moving on to the DB and platform. Um, driver and platform, they just address different uh, concerns. Um, if you think about MySQL as a, as a platform, 
there are certain aspects of MySQL that are singular, like the way it quotes and the way it, um, uh, it separates values and identifiers, so on and so forth. Uh, but it has, PHP has a variety of different ways of connecting to MySQL, um, being PDO, MySQL I, uh, so on and so forth. So that's why you see there's a division between the driver and the platform objects. And it also makes things easier to mock. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one of the design decisions there. By and large, you don't have to really be concerned with that design implementation um, as most of the uh, table gateway and the SQL objects, they, they interact with those objects for you. So thanks, Ralph. Um, the reason I asked Ralph for that is I guess you did the lion's share of the work on ZenDB, Ralph, so you're far more qualified than I to answer that. Um, where would you put the config, like, application environment development testing stage in production? Um, it's a good question. Personally, I use the service manager to do that, but then I tend to use the service manager to do everything. Um, you can um, effectively do that um, any way you want, I guess, realistically. Is there any standard method for separating out your, your uh, environments? Do you know, Ralph? Yeah, the, the, instead of separating out environments like um, inside of a configuration file, what we see people doing is they have a configuration file per environment. Um, so yep. what you'll generally see is that the configuration files in your third-party code, that'll just be module.config.php. Um, at, up at your application layer is where you have an opportunity to override any setting that was previously merged in. Um, so what you'll have is people will put development files or you know applications.development.php yeah. in there, and then based off of maybe some you know, global um, uh, environment variable or something, they'll switch the loading of that particular uh, configuration file in place. So in in the example that's on the slides now, you have um, basically uh, development.local.php. You have um, production.local.php, staging.local.php, which are excluded from your um, version control system and just sit in, in the right place in the right environment. That's right. Specifically, the, that autoload directory is for these kinds of um, yeah. uh, you know, runtime decisions, so to speak. So uh, I guess we've got time for one more quick question. I'll just put the slide up for those of you who are interested in things like certification and training. Um, there's a, a great web link there. So the question is, which I think is a, I think this is a very pertinent question. Um, convert an application which uses Zen from Oak 1 to Zen from Oak 2, good or bad idea? Um, PHP Arch had a two-part article about migration and they concluded that it was a pain. It is a pain because because fundamentally Zen from Oak One and Zen from Oak Two are completely different pro uh, products. They're not um, Zen from Oak Two is not a point release from Zen from Oak One. It is a completely different product. So the question is, do you need to leverage the uh, the added benefits of Zen from Oak Two? And if so, then you need to think about rewriting your project. I mean, I've I mean, the, considering myself rewriting a project from Zenframework 1 to Zenframework 2, you find that a lot of the views you can move with minimal work. There still will be work, but minimal work. But it's effectively a case of rewriting everything from the controllers to the services to the, to the view helpers. So yes, it is a major pain, but it's equatable for me from moving from Zenframework 1 to any other um, any other framework, basically, you know, to Codeigniter or, or to Symfony or, or to any other framework. So the question is, the service locator and factory's loading configuration can only be array-based, or can they be any other way as well? Um, they're PHP functions. They can generate those arrays in any other way that you want them to be. Um, they, the, the only point is that these functions have to return arrays. So how you de derive those arrays is, is you know, basically up to you. It's you can use any other method you want, but yes, they have to return arrays, and they have to return arrays in the correct uh, structure so that they can be merged into the global config. Okay, I guess I can't see any more incredibly pertinent questions, so I'll say thank you guys for um, 
thank you guys for listening, and I hope you all have some uh, some luck and some joys working with Zadar Freiburg too. Um, I will be, if we do take the plunge and convert a medium-sized project from Zen from one to Zen from two, I'll certainly um, document that uh, blog about it, give any advice or any fundamental uh, ideas I can. Um, so keep an eye on the blog, and you may well come back and do a webinar on that in the in the future as well. So thanks all for attending.